So moving on to drums again, I can't um, play in real time the full drums through the mastering chain because my CPU can't handle it. So I bounced a stem here. Uh, don't be fooled by the name, it's actually drums. Uh, so this is what the final drums uh, sounded like. So you'll notice that the drums are definitely the beefiest part of this entire mix. Um, the way I worked things out, I sort of wanted the bass and the guitars to form one single very smooth unit with not a lot of dynamic range between them. Um, and things are compressed, limited, and treated um, to that end. In the case of the drums, I had more room to maneuver because I knew that I could count on the, uh, well there's no vocals, and then in addition to that I knew I could count on the bass and guitars being pretty consistent. So I let that dynamic range be taken up by the drums. Um, the kick and the snare are very, very, um, they're almost a little tacky, uh, but the rest of the mix, mix is so dense that you sort of can't, it, it, it worked out in the end, I think. It doesn't sound too bad. So I've turned off the um, main chain, but just let's go through the drums quickly. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail because it could take forever, but um, the drum bus, I've just got some basic stuff like... Um, a tiny, tiny bit of a low and high shelf, um, some um, console saturation, Fab Filter Saturn. I think here this was designed to make the kick stand out a little bit more. Sound Toys Decapitator. Um, this is uh, pretty rough saturation. It's pretty ugly. I added a, a decent amount of it, um, but with almost no drive. And so what this essentially does is that it. Um, just thickens the drums up a little more. So let's solo them, then listen to it with it off, then with it on. So here's with uh, Decapitator off. Now with it on. It brings the cymbals, the snare, and the kick a little bit to the fore, which is what I was sort of going for. Tiny bit of EQ just to accentuate the mid range. And that's, you know, sort of the drum bus. As far as what the drums actually are here, uh, this is Superior Drummer 2, it's the Progressive Foundry kit, and I think this is, everything is set to default. Um, it's the Black Panther Maple Snare, the, uh, that's true, this is slightly different, the Pearl Masters Extra Kick, um, and then, you know, Symbols to Taste. And I definitely cheated on the bleed and stuff a little bit. I, I'm not sure I would do this again, but I actually did leave all of the, um, all of the uh, condenser microphones on instead of just using dynamic mics, which are more popular for metal, I think. I've never mic'd a real drum kit, but I've spent a lot of time watching videos of people doing it. Um, and I think in the future I would actually use mostly condenser mics, just full on turn off the, um, use dynamic mics, turn off the condensers. But I definitely played around a lot with the bleed, and I did something which is just like, uh, I created a real zombie kit here. I took a bunch of the overheads and room mics, and I turned every single thing off except for the snare. Yeah, see here. So this, a lot of uh, people, a lot of producers end up doing some sort of trick either with multiband compression, with an expander, with a gate, where they try to clamp down on the cymbal bleed on the room tracks uh, to accentuate, basically have things bump up when the snare is hit and to kill as much of that cymbal bleed as possible so that the room mics are mostly um, snare, essentially, um, or, you know, the, the shells. And uh, you can replicate that. You can certainly do the exact same thing, or you can cheat in Superior Drummer because they've recorded these hits individually and just turn off the bleed, which is what I've done. So I just stacked that snare over and over and over and over again so that my room mics, my room bus has a ton of snare on it from different sources. That's the main thing that I really did here that makes any sort of difference. Everything else is pretty much academic. The kick, um, let's listen to the kick by itself. I compressed this quite a bit, uh, but I didn't use any sample replacement. I could have used a one shot, but I didn't because I wanted it to be a little bit more raw. 
So I did some pretty significant cutting here, a little bit of boosting. Uh, I found the high end was a little bit too harsh for my taste. Transient controller, something I would use less of in the future. This sounds a little tacky. Very, very small amount of R base. This is mostly, this is entirely just saturation from an SSL uh, channel uh, emulator from Waves. And then the, the Golden God, the beautiful, the Metric Halo channel strip set to Mio. Uh, I can't say I copied this from Nolly because almost every producer in metal uses this plugin and there's a reason it's old, it's ugly, but damn, it is so snappy. Um, it's just, here, listen to this with it off and on. So here's with it off and then on. It just brings it right to the forefront. It doesn't neuter it too much. It's just, it's beautiful. Um, I use it on kick, I use it on snare. It's even good on toms. So there's that. Here's another place where I shamelessly copied Nolly. Um, he has a trick where, in his case, it's designed to mainly control uh, cymbal bleed um, on the snare mic and to, um, but it's also uh, designed to split it into different bands. So what he does is he puts a, uh, I think he uses an expander, but I mean, this is essentially the same thing where you um, bypass three of these, um, three of these ranges and then use the top range from about 4,000 up and you drop it. Um, and so this is a, an expander. So we're using wave C4 multiband compressor, by the way, but it, it function, functions as an expander here. Every time the snares hit, um, it bumps up the highs and then immediately reduces them back down uh, to the tune of 8 dB. So here's what the snare top sounds like with this off. Now let's kill the verb. And with it on. So a huge difference. It gets rid of a lot of that washiness and then you can leave the snare bottom and uh, turn the volume up. I use like a, a light low pass um, but you can turn the volume on the snare bottom up and use that to fill out that top range that's being subtracted here. And that way you have a better blend and it just sounds w much more consistent and um, a lot less um, squishy. It's a lot more like snappy instead of like thwappy. Uh, so here's the whole snare with this effect. Um, first off and then on. So off and now on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just much more controlled. The reverb is uh, verbiage for the default settings. Stole that from Nolly. Uh, I have a little bit of mid-side EQ here just to get rid of some of the, um, some of the grossness in the left-hand side. A little bit of compression on that reverb. Uh, a little bit of transient control just to tighten it up. And then a tiny bit of saturation. I'm not even sure why this is here, but I just sort of left it on. Uh, but what does the uh, reverb sound like by itself? It's huge, it's a little tacky, and there's a lot of it, uh, but it worked. The 1176 bus, so here this is um, a trick that almost every producer, especially metal, uses. It's parallel compression. You send your shell drums and your verb in your room uh, to an auxiliary bus. On that bus, you have an 1176 or some sort of similar type of compressor that just smashes the living hell out of it. Uh, sometimes you use a little bit of EQ, like here I boosted the, the low end. And the point here is to um, make it, have your, your initial tracks sort of serve as the foundational sound. And then the 1176 fills in the sustain for the most part. So here's what the 1176 sounds like by itself. We're doing like 12 dB of gain reduction here. It's a lot. Uh, and the routing is that it's receiving from the snare bus, the verb, the toms in the room. And I've modified these to taste so that you get a ton of snare, a little bit less of everything else. Um, and the kick, much less of the kick. So here's what the drums sound like without the 1176 on at all. So some of that is the volume effect, you know, it sounds better when it's louder, but a lot of it is really just the sustain being filled out. Hi-hat, almost nothing. I've high-passed the living hell of it, a little bit of a top boost. Um, I think this was subtracted for the kick, but I guess I left it off. 
and a tiny, tiny bit of 8% of uh, room just to make the drum kit sort of gel together. Toms, uh, I mixed this in about five minutes and I couldn't find anything that sounded better than this at the end. Um, I think it's the sort of thing where the rest of the drums are pretty clinical and carefully sculpted, so you need one thing that makes them sound full and coherent and uh, analog, as it were. So I just cut the lows, boosted the highs, transient controller, again, snappy, uh, Mio metric halo, clipped them a little bit, and then gated them. And this is what the drums sound like by themselves. The, sorry, the toms. Pretty simple stuff. Overheads. So some of these have the Frankenstein thing I mentioned where I had, I think, four sets of overheads, four overhead mics in that progressive foundry kit. And I turned all of them on and I turned the snare on on all of them to varying degrees. So there's a lot more snare here than there normally would be. And I uh, did some normal cutting and boosting to get rid of the muddy low end. Added a tiny bit of verb just to flesh out that sound. The room. So again, another place where I created a Frankenstein snare. Here. I mainly just did a high pass filter and boosted the top end a little bit because I wasn't as worried about cymbal bleed, so I could add some sort of zazzle and uh, spice to it. And then I uh, pretty well compressed the low mids so there isn't a lot of movement around there. Those are the drums. Um, there's not a huge amount of processing being done on them, but I definitely used some audio cheating in the way that I routed it uh, in Superior Drummer to allow me to achieve this sound. And uh, I spent a lot of time making sure that the transients in the drums, the shells were poking through the rest of the instruments. That was what I spent the most time uh, combating, making sure that the bass and the kick could be heard together and that they were one unit, but that the kick wasn't getting smothered by the bass. That was overwhelmingly the toughest thing I had to navigate uh, with this record.